Do you enjoy the podcast? Well, I could really use your help to make the show better. For instance, there are a couple of things I could try from time to time to improve guests' audio. I'd like to have an app, making the show easier to be managed on your device or tablet. The only funding I have for the show is from you listeners. So why not become a patron of the show? A small monthly contribution via PayPal or Patreon is appreciated and those small donations count. To find out how you can contribute, go to www.podcast.com and click on the support page. For supporters of the show, I do try to give something back as a thank you such as extra discussion from guests or this month, that's February 2017, I have a free prize draw to win a copy of the West Point History of World War II. So that's www.podcast.com and click on support to help me make the show better for you. Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, we're returning to Operation Husky, this time looking at the 82nd Airborne. Operation Husky was the invasion of Sicily by the Allies in 1943, and it would be the first large-scale use of airborne troops by the Allies. I'm joined by Lieutenant Colonel Joe Pacino of the 82nd Airborne. Joe is currently a serving officer and could be heard on the All American Legacy podcast. Joe, thanks for joining me. Um, If we're looking at the 82nd Airborne element of uh, Husky, it's probably worth looking at the 82nd themselves. Mm. Yeah. Um, They were only recently designated Airborne. Right, yeah. Entering into World War II, this was a new thing, at least for the Americans. But, um, you know, the Germans had success, had some success with... uh, with airborne forces, and this was an idea that you know a small group of officers in, in our army were trying to emulate. And then uh, you know the, the Germans, you know, strangely, uh, the Germans at Crete. This was a successful operation at Crete, but it was uh, it's teetered on success, and, and, you know, and, and was so uh, sort of close to failure that it's uh, that that really the Germans had no real appetite to continue this afterwards. But it sparked uh, the, the Allies to try to build up this capability. And so the army was pulling divisions, you know, out of the reserves to uh, stand them back up into the active component, into the active force for World War II, and had to identify a division for this capability, and the 82nd was identified. So the 82nd was mobilized for World War II as a standard infantry division, and then the decision was made uh, to transition the 82nd to an airborne division. I mean, how were they envisaged to be used? The similar sort of lines to the Germans. I mean, were they basing basing what they thought the need was going to be on, say, Crete? What's interesting about Crete is that it was the end of the the German airborne experience, but it was the start of, in many ways, it was the start of the American airborne experience in, in combat. I guess it was just two different ways of of generals looking at this thing, you know, from the German. Experiences. Well, we're, ne- we're never doing this again. There's too little ability to control this thing. There's too many things that can go wrong. And from the American experience, it was well. This is a this is a capability that we can really use to reinforce our our divisions. And so that that was kind of uh, initially initially how they were going to be used. There was a sort of debate, and and we see it, we saw this debate actually play out throughout World War II whether they would be a tactical capability, which is really how they were kind of used in, in Husky tactical, meaning that they're dropped close inland and they take uh, key terrain, or whether they're a strategic capability like in in Operation Market Garden where they're dropped miles and miles from the objective. I think really St. Mary Glace and Normandy really kind of split those two, but but it, it wasn't uh, – there, there was a debate about how they would be used, you know, tactically or strategically or whether they would be used to reinforce a, an objective that was already secured. So that so it would be – and we saw that in Salerno, actually. So that would be another way of using the airborne force that they would reinforce an objective. that They would not do a contested entry. They would not do a forced entry. They would reinforce – they would very quickly reinforce something that was already secured. So that – really doctrinal argument was never settled and never even got settled during the war. So Husky was going to be the first 
really large scale uh, drop for them. Uh, but just prior to that, there was some drops at tro- Torch, wasn't there? How had they gone? Was anything drawn out from that? Nothing was was too drawn out. It was it was such a small operation, and it was so insignificant to the success at Torch that there was no real. There, there was nothing that really could be applied to something on the scale of Husky. There, there was a battalion in, in uh, Operation Torch in North Africa. There was a battalion, the 509th Parachute Infantry Battalion, that participated. That was the first parachute assault in U.S. Mm. history. It, it, it's funny because uh, uh, the only the only note I sort of found was that you know, the, the <laughs> poor weather resulted in the wrong drop zone. As we'll say, that that becomes familiar throughout all the uh, airborne drops. <laughs> So when we when when they decide to go into uh, Sicily and, uh, and, and Husky, why did they feel they needed the airborne? What was their initial objectives? The eighty second would uh, be part of a massive airborne assault the night before, the night of the ninth, nine July, and reinforce the first infantry division. Really set the conditions for the first infantry divisions in the uh, Jella sector by cutting lines of communication and disrupting routes uh, for the Italian forces and for uh, what turned out to be the Hermann Goring Division, uh, although the 82nd did not know that um, the Italian forces were reinforced by uh, the Hermann Goring Division. And then later, uh, they were to effect link up with General uh, Terry de la Mesa's 1st Infantry Division at the Ponte Oliva Airfield. Um, so those were, in a broad sense, the objectives for the 82nd Airborne Division. What uh, General Patton and General Eisenhower hoped that the 82nd would do was really just slow down the ground forces there in Sicily for the 1st Infantry Division. And by and large, uh, the 82nd actually did, despite uh, all the problems with, with getting uh, – you know, getting to the objective and getting on the ground. Yeah. Well, the, uh, you know, getting getting on the ground was actually their their uh, obviously the the first thing they had to get get over. And something that had never occurred to me was the availability of aircraft being a problem to get so many on the ground with the British also fighting for um, for aircraft because the eighty second I think were almost cut out of the operation and sent to be used as a reserve fighting with the British. Yeah, most of the division actually was used as a reserve, but yeah, they were almost cut out, and they were sort of an afterthought when, when uh, in terms of allocating aircraft. So they, they had to reduce, you know, General Ridgeway, the commander of the 82nd, had to reduce the number of paratroopers committed to Sicily because there just were not enough aircraft to to go around. When we, when we talk about the aircraft, I mean, they they weren't desi- they weren't permanently designated for this uh use i mean how much cooperation between the airport airborne troops and uh you know the, the, the troop carrier pilots and and the whole of that organization was put in place before had they practiced do they do they come as a package they practiced more than we think so the 52nd troop carrier wing was scheduled to carry the 82nd from North Africa to Sicily, and they had trained together at Fort Bragg. But it is worth noting, and uh, it, it is, I guess, well documented in history that during that uh, training, you know, General Ridgeway noted that the 52nd Troop Carrier Wing t- is not capable of conducting night operations. He was concerned about that. That concern kind of went went unheeded, and he did make that known to both Eisenhower and Patton before 9 July 1943. But the decision was made to go through with the night drop anyway, largely, you know, at the time. I, th- I think in understanding co- some of these decisions, we've got to understand that there was a greater willingness to accept casualties than you will ever see in any modern, any current current day operation. Yes, well, that's true. Um, so did they train at all for night drops once they knew it was on the, on the cards? Really, they had no real way to train this kind of operation at night. So they, they just had no way to replicate it. So not in the way that they trained, you know, for Salerno, which was a, a dusk uh, drop. Not really. I hadn't realized that. I presumed that uh, they trained quite a lot for it because it somehow seems obvious that you would use them at, at night. Sort of really does sort of a, a, explain things um, <laughs> somewhat. Well, so they did that. They in, in uh, North Africa, the division did two regimental-sized jumps 
those were problematic, you know, and they never replicated the full conditions of Sicily. But even those were problematic, you know, the pilots in some of those cases dropped the paratroopers in the wrong at the wrong drop zone. Leading into uh, Sicily, I think, leading into Operation Husky, it was clear that there were going to be some problems. It was it was clear to Ridgeway at least, Ridgeway and Gavin. Had they done anything to to, to counter the fact that they? Um, if you know, if it was going to be clear to them that there was going to be problems with getting people to the right spot, had they done anything to prepare people for uh, being misdropped? They did. The eighty second did. Yes. So one of the reasons that um, the eighty second was selected, the eighty second division was selected for this airborne capability uh, was because of uh, General Ridgeway, General Ridgeway and, and Omar Bradley. And so they had prepared the division to operate in, in small groups, to uh, operate independently. This is before they were selected for an airborne capability and to exercise disciplined initiative. And that is what the airborne needed. So that's one of the reasons why uh, they were selected was that Ridgeway had them trained so well to operate in small groups. And you saw that uh, in Sicily, that if they if they just got onto the ground, if they got to the drop zone, they could find one another and they could, uh, you know, as, as General Patton said, they could wreak havoc. Or I think, uh, you know, one of the, one of the Italian uh, officers said they would introduce mischief. So, you know, we, we call that in today's vernacular, we call that friction introduce friction into the battlefield. And if you can introduce friction, you can slow things down. They slowed down the Hermann Goring division in Sicily. All, all things being equal, whoever overcomes friction the best and the, the, the quickest is uh, going to have, is likely to have more success. So that was, that was the idea, but it was, it was understood that there would be a high casualty rate from the 82nd Airborne Division. If this even worked, you know, if we could, if this even worked, of getting them onto the drop zone. So yeah, we, we've touched upon this. The first problem is getting them uh, to the drop zone. Uh, what problems did they have? How did they get on? Well, you know, so so nine July, the night, the evening of nine July was when they parted North Africa for Sicily, and right before, you know, this is in uh, Gavin's diary, General Gavin's diary, Colonel Jim Gavin at the time. In his diary, that right before um, the door closed on his aircraft, somebody stuck their head in and said, "We've got 35 mile an hour winds east to west, so you would never conduct an airborne operation in those conditions uh, today." You know, he prepared for hard landing, but uh, once once the aircraft took off, you know that wrecked havoc on on the pilot's ability to calculate time and distance because they calculated those things based on they calculated how far they were based on how long they were flying. And so they were, you know, flying. They were moving at a slower distance because of the wind. The wind was pushing them. And so the other the other problem was the sun started to set as they kind of were in the air. You know, if you couldn't see the, the tip of the wings of the aircraft in front of you, you couldn't see the aircraft at all. So they broke up into they were broken up into smaller groups. One of the one of the identifying terrain features was was Malta. Some of them didn't quite know they were over Malta. Some of them mistook Sicily for Malta. There was just there was kind of just mass confusion there. I've got read somewhere that uh, yeah, half the half of them failed to reach their rally points once they were uh, with, with their drops. So that, they really are scattered everywhere. So they got yeah. scattered everywhere. You know, Gavin really had no idea where he was. And then um, you know the the other thing was that uh, a lot of them were were dropped onto hard terrain, so they they were injured or they were they were killed on on the landing. You know, on 10 July at 0245 is when the main amphib- amphibious assault was scheduled to go. So so we, uh, the 82nd Airborne Division was to drop ahead of that time. Um, and once they got there, they were, uh, you know, they were scattered everywhere. You know, they, they've been, they've been blown off course by the winds. So even if, even the ones that were dropped over the right drop zone, they were blown further uh, off of the drop zone. It, it was, it was chaotic, but to their ultimate credit, you know, they operated in what's known as little groups of paratroopers, they, they arrived in the drop zone. They found one another. They found other paratroopers, even those that were not they had not uh, directly trained with, and they started to um, cut communication lines. They started to find the uh, the tanks of the Hermann Göring division. They they began to find the uh, soldiers of the Hermann Göring division. They took high ground. 
you know, they slowed things down, certainly, for the Germans and the Italian forces. They slowed the German and Italian forces down. It's like Gavin match into the sound of gunfire because he had no idea where he was himself. Right, he had no idea where he was himself and he did not know that uh, the Germans had reinforced Sicily with the Hermann Goring division. Yeah, so he marched to the sound of the guns and and yet uh, and he, he had six people with him so he, he kind of took six people, the six people he found and they just started to uh, introduce friction. It's incredible that you, the, the, uh, the, the commander on the ground can only command five men or six men yeah, out of uh, you know the I can't did I write down? I'm not sure. I noticed how many jumped on that first night, but it was a couple of thousand or so, wasn't it? Uh, it was a couple of thousand. Yeah, I've got the, I've got the yeah, numbers that's, here. That's uh, pretty pretty pathetic. But they did manage to cause trouble. He did manage to link up later when when day broke. They did manage to he did manage to find more of his his own people and this is pulled together a scratch force. Right, right. Yeah, as as the the day of ten July wore on, they they gathered into larger and larger forces and actually began to secure the objectives that uh, that they were sent to uh, to secure. You know, wh- one of the things uh, Colonel Gavin is he was the uh, commander of the five hundred fifth Parachute Infantry Regiment, and um, before on, on the night of nine July, when uh, the paratroopers were getting ready to board the aircraft. They each received a letter, a mimeographed message from Colonel Gavin, and we refer to this message here a lot because it does speak to the the legacy and the culture. I, I won't read the whole thing, but if, but I just want to read this one part here towards the end. Here he says, uh, "The term American parachutist has become synonymous with courage of a high order. Let us carry the fight to the enemy and make the American parachutist feared and respected through all his ranks. Attack violently, destroy him wherever found." So. They did that, certainly, and that's been, I think, the, the sort of the clarion call of this division ever since. You know, that's been the guiding philosophy of this division ever since. If you look at the other operations we've participated in and the way the global response force that we have today in the 82nd is postured, those things really harken back to this notion of this really romantic notion of, of courage from uh, Colonel Gavin. Well, you just have to look what he did on the day at uh, is it Biaza Ridge that they stru- struggled to hold against. I think that was the, that was the arm of the Herman Goering, wasn't it? With seven hundred infantry, armored artillery battalion, and a couple of tiger tanks. You know, Biaza Ridge is is one of uh, is really part of our a big part of our legacy here. You know, there's a road here in Fort Bragg that's named after it. So, you know, what one of the the stories that uh, is told from that night is the story of Private Reed Satterstrom. Gavin's orders were, everyone's going to jump unless they'd already died. You know, everybody's going to jump. Everybody gets off the aircraft. Nobody returns to North Africa with the aircraft. So Private Reed Satterstrom, his uh, snap hook would not would not open. You know, so his uh, static line that opens, you know, opens the chute, it, the, the snap hook wouldn't, wouldn't open. So he handed the static line to the plane crew chief as on his way out. And says, whatever you do, hold on to this. The crew chief braced himself against the bulkhead and Satterstrom went out. He's holding the reserve. His hand was on the reserve the whole time. To his ultimate credit, the crew chief held on to the static line. The guy's shoot, shoot opened. It's quite a story. I, I didn't necessarily believe that story when I first heard it, but uh, it's, it's recounted uh, in three different places. And there were two other paratroopers who witnessed it and documented it. So It's the... Crew chief, that you wouldn't be worried about getting pulled out. You'd have thought it would have been his uh, problem. <laughs> well, you just would have thought he would never. Yeah, right. Or he just never. There'd be no way to hold on to this. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, presumably he'd have to brace and cling on for grim death to something else himself. <laughs> That's that is a great story of uh, yeah of, of just getting on the ground. <laughs> um. They drop these poor buggers in and they think they're going to be facing one thing and then suddenly you've got the Hermann Goering division. Uh, it's the same as Market Garden. Yeah. Right, although, you know, the Hermann Goering division was sort of a an economy of force. The Hermann Goering division was under strength and was not uh, a very well-trained organization, quite frankly. So that should be understood in the in the process of understanding this. But they did have tanks, they had Tiger tanks, and so um, that was a surprise to uh, the All-American division. Yeah, and they'd, they were fitted with, they're issued with bazookas, which would, were bouncing off them. Yeah, they were fitted with bazookas. So the 82nd... Uh, 
who fitted with bazookas, and the problem with, is that to kill a Tiger tank, you had to get it from the right angle. Colonel Gavin, the 505th commander, he in the morning, in sunlight, he found a lot of the airborne paratroopers were, and their bazookas were crushed uh, by tank tracks. Frightening, isn't it? When you think about the modern combat, I mean, it's an odd thing to think that you know, we asked people to, to do something that had a very small chance to succeed. Some did uh, uh, land according to plan. I mean, how how well did they manage to uh, achieve their objective? I, mean, I guess ultimately they held out as as the bridgehead was secured and, and the uh, infantry crew were sure. But for those who landed, I mean, I guess if you've got an objective, I guess what I'm trying to say is if you've got an objective to take and most of your men, the men don't turn up to take it, did they carry on and manage to achieve the objectives, those objectives that they were given? Yeah, they did. You know, the, the Italians thought that uh, – some of the Italians thought that there were three airborne infantry divisions. That, okay, so they, they just – was they saw so many of them. They saw so much activity, so much movement, um, so much disruption of lines of communication. One, one of the historical arguments that c- comes out of this is – would the invasion of Sicily been a, an Allied success were it not for the 82nd Airborne Division? I think history tells us that it would have. It actually would have. And in fact, that's that's actually there's no question about that. It would have. However, the first infantry division would have taken more casualties. Historically, the, the question, or, or the, not even historically, but immediately in the aftermath, the question was: was it was it worth it? You know, we we took such a high casualty rate on these airborne forces that. Um, was it worth it? And then, and then the question for the Allies and for Eisenhower was: Is it worth it to maintain this capability? Should we even keep this division as an airborne division, or should we revert back to? Should we just give, make him an infantry division? You, you very much was a, an experiment, and you, I kind of wonder at the end of it all. And we haven't even touched on the fact that you know, there's a second wave that came, and that was almost worse worse than the first wave. It was it was worse than the first wave, yeah. So. <laughs> Because <laughs> they got hit by friendly fire. Yeah. So an- another thing, we talked about Ridgeway being concerned about the, the inability of the pilots to fly at night. But one of the things he, he said in, uh, in I guess it would have been June, June of 1943, was that um, the Allied naval commanders didn't wouldn't accept he had strict fire control measures that he felt were necessary to do a large airborne invasion. The Allied naval commanders would not accept that. He brought that as well to the attention of Eisenhower and Patton. On the first drop, the, on the night of the 9th and the 10th, you know, night of the 9th, morning of the 10th, that route stayed away from the naval convoys. So there was no real risk of, of friendly fire. But uh, the 11 July, which was actually the third of three uh, movements for the 82nd, that, that flew over the naval convoys that had been bombarded. In June, Eisenhower made the naval Allied commanders aware of this, that there was, you know, the, that uh, there was an airborne component to this operation. But that was really just about it. They, they kind of made everyone aware, and they didn't really implement the kind of fire control measures that Ridgeway was looking for. You know, the night of the 11th, July 11th, there were a series of air raids. The gunners were jumpy. According to Patton's diary, this is at least according to his diary. I don't know if it's true. It's at least according to his diary. He tried to call off the jumps, the airborne insertion of 11 July 1943, because he was concerned about the uh, possibility of uh, friendly fire, uh, c- catastrophic friendly fire. Uh, yeah, 23 planes crashed, 60 seriously hit. Right. So there were a couple of things there that, uh, first of all, the, the ally, as, as I said, the, the Allied – uh, naval crews were receiving fire. They they were jumpy, but the smoke from those firefights was 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 distracting the uh, the air cr- the air crews. So they had to climb even higher. So you know they've got to climb higher than normal. The naval crews couldn't tell you know who what what they were. They couldn't identify them. And then once one gun opened, all the others did. So you know Guy Lafaro, who's one of the historians who covered this part of uh, 82nd Airborne Division history, he called it a contagion that spread quickly. You know, one guy starts firing, next guy starts firing, then everybody just starts firing. And you couldn't exactly uh, blame, you know, you couldn't exactly blame them. You know, there was a pilot from the um, 52nd Troop Carrier Wing. He said uh, the next day, he said, evidently the safest place for us last night while over Sicily would have been over enemy territory. 
I mean, I think it's really significant. It's not really talked about too much, but that our, our, um, deputy division commander, Brigadier General Charles L. L. Kierens Jr., the assistant commander of the division, he was, he was lost at sea. He was on one of the aircraft that was lost at sea. His body was never found. You know, we lost a deputy division commander to uh, friendly fire. So, um, where, where was, uh, where was Matthew, Matthew Ridgeway? Did he jump? General Ridgeway, the commander of the 82nd, did not jump into Sicily. He observed the airborne assault uh, at sea from a ship at sea. He positioned himself with Patton to in a place to um, observe the landings. One of the reasons that historians believe he did that is because he only had four jumps at the time, so he was not a proficient parachutist. The division, when they got to North Africa... Ridgeway wanted to uh, conduct a series of training airborne uh, jumps, a series of training airborne operations, but the ground in North Africa was too hard and the, the winds were too high, so they were only able to conduct two regimental sized jumps in North Africa. It just wasn't conducive to safely conducting the training. Would the divisional commander usually be expected to follow in directly with his troops, or would he usually come in in a second wave? It seems kind of... Uh risky bringing him in in the first wave in normandy he came in in the first wave in uh in airborne assault now in normandy in in normandy there was a thought to um him coming in in a glider because there there was still a a sense of of risk associated with his you know his lack of experience doing this but uh, in the end the decision was made that he would he would jump in i'm not sure a glider would have been any safer to be honest <laughs> right but there would have been <laughs> There would have been nothing he would have had to have done. <laughs> no, it would have been a, a, a sweaty palmed glider pilot hoping that he, did, he didn't get shot down and be when he came down in a dark field in France that there was nothing it, 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 he was going to crash into. <laughs> right. When um, Ridgeway, when when they jump, when someone of his authority jumps in or would have jumped in, how did they expect him to operate? Because it must be incredibly difficult. It, it, it struck me it, 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 the best place for him could be not in the field insofar as he might get a better grasp of what's going on uh, away from where he can have a sensible communications area with working communications whereas if you put him in the field and people are everywhere he might have a less awareness of his battle space you know it, the, the idea with with Ridgeway and Gavin was that they would lead out front that they would lead from the front and this is the this is the the same the patent concept you know patent out in front leading tanks directing things there's still a level of behind the front though when they're leading from the car all right all right gavin at the, what was he at the time a colonel you know that's very much more his job to be in the front line it's not necessarily the general's job to be there directly with the bullets whizzing round him right right yeah i the, you know there's an element of risk uh associated with that um with that kind of command leadership and that kind of uh, direction, they really had, uh, had had developed a reputation for being uh, courageous and leading leading in this way. You know, uh, they were tough, aggressive, competent leaders, and um, they were exposed to enemy fire as much as anyone. The same, you know, Ridgeway, Gavin, uh, Colonel Tucker, the regimental commander. They they really earned their their troopers' respect and also inspired them with their courage. So. I mean, I can't think of many other units where your uh, your most senior officer would be so far. Well, essentially, they're behind enemy lines, right? Right uh, of yeah. that of that rank, right? And you know, these stories, the stories like that, and that's one of the reasons that that Gavin's um, legend uh, took off so quickly, and and he was promoted so quickly, is that the tales of his reputation within the ranks of the eighty second um, were forged very quickly and passed. You know, within this relatively small at this point cohesive unit so, so I, I made a note of this earlier and i forgot to ask it presumably you train to drop from a certain height and i couldn't help when i was reading through uh things yeah it, it was a tremendous amount of uh, casualties on the drop itself and just you know bridgeway himself he, he, he took took a leg injury of some just sprain or something didn't he um when you're when the planes become scattered and lost does that make the jump more difficult? Because hey, you don't know what height you're going out at. You don't know what's underneath. Um, is there some way of training around it, or is that just it, you've just got to suck it and see? Yeah, 
Well, I mean, the, the jump is sort of unto itself. It's a pretty simple thing to do. It's, it's, um, the airborne jump is really just a way of getting to the objective. It's, it's just a way of putting combat power on the ground very quickly. It's getting to where you're supposed to be with the people you're supposed to be with and doing what you're supposed to do. And if you're not, if you're on the wrong part of Sicily or if you're not on Sicily, you can't do that. <laughs> You know, you can't do that, or, or it'd be, it's very hard to do. So the, a lot of them did other things. They just said, well, we're here. I, I think we're on Sicily. I think those are Axis Ax forces. We're going to disrupt. We're going to do something. So it, it was just it was chaos the entire, you know, throughout. It was chaos the entire time, and there were just a lot of lessons learned. You know, the, the gunners certainly needed better preparation and aircraft identification. They didn't really have that, but the pilots needed more practice in night flying formations. There was no mechanism to mark the drop zones over husky so so those some of these improvements were made following the following uh, operation husky but well i was going to say you know when, when matthew is saying on d-day plus three of husky you know he reports about five uh of five thousand troops drops he only in command of 400 you need you need to start learning some lessons <laughs> Because it's not necessarily the best use of 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 what's available, though, as you as you point out, it, you know, they caused a lot of disruption. How did they improve? You know, getting play, people to the right spot for. I guess the next drop will be D Day. I mean, you know, how much had changed between Husky and D Day? Well, Salerno, Salerno was the next drop. For Salerno, the the drop zones were marked. So, so coming out of Husky, the, I, I think the biggest application for the rest of the war was the development of pathfinders that would mark the drop zone. And so in Salerno, the, the drop zones were marked with oil cans. Uh, the air crews were trained better in terms of how to, uh, how to get them to the drop zone. In Salerno, Salerno was an early evening, kind of a dusk drop rather than late at night. But the truth is that, that, uh, for the Allies, despite the fact that they had, a, they took a tremendous amount of casualties, the 82nd did disrupt the enemy. And so if they could continue to do that, it might be worth it. You know, the, the, the argument was for, for the argument for, for the Allies were and, and for, for Eisenhower, you know, we're running out of soldiers at this point in the war. We're running out of soldiers. They were bringing black soldiers and putting them that were cooks and putting them in white units. They didn't really know what to do. So if we're going to lose one third of our combat power on these airborne drops, should we continue to do it? And so they felt that, uh, you know, Ridgeway was committed to it. He was committed to the airborne division, the airborne concept. He just felt we had to tweak these things. We had to uh, train these things better and that this could be, this could continue to give us an advantage, you know, as we pushed uh, into the European theater. It, it's interesting because the, you know, the Germans had obviously had a not dissimilar conversation with themselves and they were not as persuaded after Crete. <laughs> Uh, yeah, obviously, presumably Eisenhower and presumably Montgomery uh, must have had that conversation and decided that there was something well w worthwhile there with these mass drops. Really, Ridgway really had to convince um, Eisenhower. And so in September 1943, Eisenhower wrote a letter to Marshall that where he said, you know, a quote is, I do not believe in the airborne division. And so I think uh, historically we think em there's emphasis on the word division, that he believed that you could do this in, in smaller groups with smaller units, but that at the division size, you lose the ability to command and control. You assume too much risk. It's too much chaos. All the things we saw manifest in Sicily. The War Department took a critical look. You know, Eisenhower had the War Department take a really critical look at this. Uh, two things came out of the mishaps here at, uh, at Sicily. One was training circular 113, which is a... a more refined, robust doctrine of airborne and troop carrier forces and the application thereof. And the second was in uh, December of 1943 was the Knollwood Maneuvers. And uh, the Knollwood man Maneuvers were really a proof of principle of the employment of an airborne division using Training Circular 113. It was a pretty big training operation called the Nolwood, Nolwood Maneuvers because the, the goal was to capture the Nolwood Airport, which is now known as the Moore County Airport here in North Carolina. And uh, it was a six-day operation with uh, hundreds of paratroopers taking off from five separate airfields. There was Pope Army Airfield, which is here, which is now Fort Bragg, Pope Airfield and Fort Bragg. 
and then others across uh, the United States. And the, the aircraft met over the Atlantic Ocean and then uh, dropped uh, paratroopers uh, from the 11th Airborne Division. The 11th Airborne Division participated in this. Uh, the commander of the 11th Airborne Division, Major General Joe Swing, had been the division artillery commander for the 82nd previously. He had a hand in, in the codification of the doctrine and in the writing of Training Circular 113. And the Norwood maneuvers were a success. Uh, Eisenhower saw that. And as a result, the 82nd was maintained as an airborne division, but it could have easily gone the other way. And, and had the Norwood maneuvers not been a success, the division, the 82nd, I am certain uh, that the 82nd would be the 82nd Infantry Division today if it had survived. The big, I think, takeaway was that in Sicily, that Ridgeway and Gavin demonstrated that they were tough, aggressive, and that uh, they could operate independently, that they could move to the sounds of the guns quickly, and that they could disrupt. And so that uh, had a lot of weight with Eisenhower. You know, there's a couple of really high-profile books that refer to the Nullwood maneuvers as a combined arms rehearsal for D-Day. And that does not seem to be historically accurate. It seems that this was – it was a concept of whether we were going to continue with these airborne divisions or whether we were going to go to, with smaller packages of airborne forces. I did try to look up the Nullwood, and it, it, it's kind of like Fight Club. The first, first uh, you know, don't mention Nullwood maneuvers. They get it gets referred to, and there's not a lot in it. What had changed in uh, the training circular? That um, had they just what? What are they just sort of tightened up the doctrine, uh, which made it a success? It clarified the uh, application of uh, paratroop glider, troop carrier officers. Uh, glider and transport pilots, so it included a lot more things that hadn't been in the earlier uh, doctrine. The, the previous doctrine was training memorandum number 43. That didn't include any training for uh, the pilots. It didn't include any training training for the, the gunners at sea. All the things that we saw went wrong in Sicily, so it was a, just a more robust address of all the things that are involved in large-scale airborne operations. And to your point about to your point about uh, the Nolwood maneuvers, really, m- most of what we know, virtually all of what we know about the Nolwood maneuvers, are from the after action review and the official documents, which are in the uh, U.S. Army Center for Military History. Outside of that, you see some newspaper references around Camp McCall and around the Nolwood Airport at the time, but um, the, the real understanding of it comes from. The source documents, which, uh, you know, they're available. They're certainly um, within reach of everybody, but they're not very accessible online. So I think I think there, there's become this sense that this was a, uh, a this was a rehearsal for D-Day. And that's not the case. This was this was do or die for the airborne divisions. This is an interesting point. I hope you do keep it in the podcast here. But I, I want to say that. Um, I don't want to say this for the re- I do want to say this for the record. There are a couple of books that I don't I don't want to say what they are or who, who wrote them, but there are a couple of books. There are really two books that that we ascribe to in the eighty second as these. This is our history, and those books they largely rely on the memories. That they're largely quotes of, of people who participated in them, and. When you marry those quotes up with the official records and the source documents, you find that the the people who are quoting this, even people who were in leadership positions, didn't really know everything that was happening, and so they're they're wrong. So 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 their their statements are they're they're true they're accurate observations, but they didn't see that they weren't able to see the bigger picture because they didn't know you know things weren't communicated fully. Um, and as quickly as they are, they are now with you know the internet and, and all of our communication capabilities. So this things you've got to go to the archives, you got to go to the National Archives, the Center for Military History, and you've got to look at the source documents. Mm. Well, it, it must have been a constant learning process. By the end of the war, quite a lot of these um, lads must have jumped into combat three or four times. So, so they must have gained tremendous combat experience, uh, especially the officers and junior officers. Right. Well, this was this was also. I mean, this catastrophe was really the biggest shared experience. You know, we we have here the after action review. It's it stays here. We have a copy of it here, the, the hard copy. 
one of the original hard copies um, in the division, the after action review from the War Department, and and five points of failure were identified. The first was a lack of prior joint coordination. And I think what that really speaks to is a training between the the, uh, the Navy, the air crews, and the 82nd Airborne Division. And uh, these, you know, strict fire control measures, stricter training for the, the naval crews, and a greater coordination between the ground and the 52nd Troop Carrier Wing. The second was the confusion on behalf of the pilots. You know, they got they got lost. Uh, you know, the winds, the uh, darkness, navigation, you know, trying to navigate by, by identifying terrain features that they didn't really, that they got confused. You know, all those contributed to number two. And then third, there, there was no pathfinders, nothing marking the drop zone. And then the fourth were just the incredibly unfort- unfortunate circumstance of an enemy bombing raid coinciding with the arrival of the troop carrier elements on the 11th. Nothing you can do about friendly that. Friendly fire. Right, friendly fire. And then fifth, really negligence by some of the ground commanders who failed to warn their units that friendly aircraft were inbound. It's interesting. None of those are criticism directly of the 82nd Airborne and what they did. Right. It's it's all about really getting them there and getting them to where they needed to be. And where, and where that went wrong, there is no criticism whatsoever of, of their performance on the ground. Well, it's, it's incredible that they had so much success on the ground despite operating in such small groups and despite all of this confusion. You know, one, one of the things that was noted, is noted in the after action report is that on the, on the night 11, fortunately, a lot of the paratroopers were already hooked up. They were in, hooked up and in the door. Um, the door was open when their plane was hit. So they just, they just jumped. Only six planes were shot down with a full complement of paratroopers in them. So for the most part, uh, these planes were hit and then the paratroopers jumped. In some cases, they, these planes had already released the paratroopers, but you know that was uh, a lesson learned going forward is that as soon as they come over any allied naval <laughs> ships, they would hook up in the door. So, <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> Just in case. Is there anything in the action after action report about the British experience and any any uh, parallels or uh, that could be drawn with their experience? No, because really the focus was on whether the 82nd was going to remain an airborne division. That was really Eisenhower's focus. Was was the 82nd going to remain an airborne division or would it revert to another standard division and if and if they had to transition to an infantry division without the airborne capability could they be trained very quickly to do that i think eisenhower felt that he trusted ridgeway would be able to do that but this was a division that had no real doctrinal basis the way that the first infantry division did because it was called out of the reserves it was a drilling reserve that was mobilized for world war ii so it's not like it had some great foundation of of infantry tactics and infantry doctrine to fall back on and i think that weighed on the decision as well i just have a feeling somewhere in the back of my mind that the they were allowed to siphon off what were perceived to be better troops into the airborne uh better troops better recruits uh maybe stronger fitter more intelligent were they is that am i right in that or have i picked that out from somewhere else no that's true it was more selective that is true i mean for, well, first of all you had to uh volunteer to be airborne the 82nd was actually split down the middle on Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. When, when the decision was made that they'd become airborne, they were split down the middle. Half would go to the 82nd, half would go to the 101st, and then the 82nd had to draw. You know, they had to fill that that uh, the shortages from you know the conscripted army or from volunteers, and so you had to volunteer to be in the airborne, and then you had to pass the uh, you know to pass the airborne school. So in that sense, that was a uh, a test above being a being a soldier surely there was an argument at the end if you're looking to break them up or convert them would be you know you've got a super elite unit then if you've got uh you know either volunteers you know the the the, the better class of the volunteers you kind of got a super elite unit you could possibly even look to break them up and 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 scatter them throughout bringing up the rest of the infantry or is that never came into the equation yeah i i think this was initially just a math problem for the war department was 
we we're running out of soldiers. We have these soldiers committed to this capability. Is this a wise decision to continue? It's an inter- it is an interesting argument that the whole view of it afterwards, whether it was a, a success or not a success, or was it worth uh, you know an experiment that was worth carrying carrying on with? And in some respects, you know, Normandy is not a million miles different because again they got scattered, but again they formed into their small pockets and. Uh, caused isolated, pro- repeated isolated problems. Right, and, and again, Normandy would have been a success without the 82nd Airborne Division. We just would have taken more casualties. You just have to look at that in, in, in reviewing the history of the 82nd and World War II. Many of the same questions are asked today. Do we need this capability? Why do we retain this capability at a division size? Is it worth it? Does it still make sense to go into, you know, with uh, with all of the... Uh, you know, with all the air defense equipment that is out there in the world, does it still make sense? And, you know, if you need to get a force in, it's too late to make something. It's too late to make an airborne division. You've got to have this thing ready and trained. So, you know, that's the other thing. I, I think I told you this is that is that I tell people is that, you know, we have we have paratroopers that have like 100 jumps, 120 jumps. And then, you know, they're just training to do it in combat. They've never done it in combat. But um, the jump in Sicily was Gavin's fifth jump. And for a lot of these guys, it was – I mean, they were all in single digits. For a lot of these guys, it was their fourth. Some people, it was their eighth. But they hadn't done this a lot in training. You're jumping out of a plane at night. You're jumping out of a plane over somewhere that you don't quite know what's below you. You might not be jumping out at the right, correct height, so the ground might be on you faster than you expect. And it's your fourth, fifth jump. It's no wonder there was so many injuries. So the wind – and plus the winds were, were – you know, you're looking at 30-knot winds and above – and here, I think on Fort Bragg, I think the standard is like 12 knots. You can't jump above 12 knots. That's an incredible wind for that that kind of material. I wonder why they never called it off or if they just were, it was just not thought, you know. Well, no, I, th- I just think that, that it was understood that there were going to be a lot of casualties. And if this, you know, if this worked, it worked. You know, the, the, that's in, uh, it's in one of the books, one of the Eisenhower books that, Eisenhower's notion was uh, this may not work. All these airborne paratroopers will get killed, but um, it'll certainly be a distraction type thing. Is there anything that they learned from the back of, well, really the Second World War experience of, of, of these jumps that, that, that has been carried on uh, in, today's, in t- today's training? Oh, you know, well, the, the, the LGOPS concept, little groups of paratroopers, that's something that is uh, in our DNA. That's something that we have to be able to do and that um, we did. How does that work? Just the idea of discipline initiative. So you get to the drop zone, you establish link up with your other paratroopers and you have a general understanding of, of uh, your objectives. You have your understanding of your objectives and then you accomplish your objectives. So if you think about a traditional military force, Things are always very regimented, and you, you've got uh, you know Patton out front pointing out where to go, and you've got uh, General Terry De La Mesa giving orders. That's not the case with an airborne force. You know, you've you've got to be able to make decisions at the lowest level, and that's uh, that is unique. That's unique. To, that was always unique to the eighty second Airborne Division. Was there anything else that came out that sort of carried up, carried across? I, I think it's not really fully understand and understood how contentious this was, though, coming out of Sicily, that uh, there was a real move to make the 82nd a standard infantry division and uh, not an, an airborne in, uh, division. Th- there, was a, there was a notion in the War Department that it didn't make any sense to have a full division of airborne capability. Well, it, it's curious at the end of the war, that was the end of it sort of for the parachute itself as a technology, but then obviously the helicopter came in to do essentially the same job but uh could deliver people with a bit more of a surgical skill <laughs> a little less randomness <laughs> you know in, in october 1943 uh the war department published a training circular training circular 113 employment of airborne and troop carrier forces which described in a little bit greater detail the procedures for planning coordination execution and and really the coordination between the air and the sea uh, as parachutes were en route. The discussion after that, if that was published, was are these a strategic asset, like in Market Garden, or are they a tactical asset, like in Normandy? How do we use these forces? And I think, like I said at the top, 
that was never that argument was never fully solved. Other than to say that you know you, there was there was a wide range of of uh, ways that you can employ this division, and as there are now, as you know that's, that's still true now. You can use the eighty second in something like uh, Haiti, where you can you know uh, humanitarian assistance, where you can get something in very quickly, or in Katrina, you know you had this division that has this airborne capability and they're ready all the time because they have the airborne capability so they can do an air land and go in somewhere and do a humanitarian assistance or support to civil authorities or obviously, you know, full scale combat like in Panama where you can put a force in within 18 hours and begin a high intensity conflict. Mm. Joe, Joe, I think, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, if you want to hear more about the 82nd Airborne, the All American Legacy podcast is well worth a listen, telling the history of the division over the last hundred years. I'll put a link on the website. As ever, don't forget to keep an eye on the World War II podcast Facebook page. I'll have a couple of weeks of posts based around Operation Husky and the Airborne side of the operation. And don't forget, if you're feeling philanthropic, and would like to help support the show, go to www2podcast.com and click on support to see how that works. A dollar, pound, euro each month is really very much appreciated. I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening. <laughs>